Good afternoon and, and welcome to the forum at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. It's uh, hard to imagine a more timely or authoritative voice on issues that are of great concern to all of us than this evening's distinguished speaker, the former Prime Minister and Defense Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. From last August's attack by Saddam Hussein to the Scud missile attacks on Israel to the 100-hour war to the most recent tragedy of the Kurds, the dramatic events of the last nine months have altered the landscape of the Middle East. And now is a, a, a watershed moment, a potential historic turning point in political arrangements in the, in the Middle East, not least for, for the state of Israel. And indeed, the last 48 hours seem to have given some faint glimmers of, of hope for per perhaps new progress in the dialogue between Israel and its Arab neighbors. While Itzhak Rabin is not a member of the current government, he's long been a voice for pragmatic, realistic negotiation and progress. Through five decades of extraordinary public and military service, he has been and he continues to be one of the most respected, one of the most popular, one of the most influential leaders in Israeli history. His military exploits are legion from his days as an army officer to his uh, exploits, his achievements as commander of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, in the Six-Day War of 1967. He then served as the Israeli ambassador in Washington before uh, joining the, uh, becoming a member of the Knesset and then very quickly after becoming a member of the Knesset, uh, dramatically rising to the position of prime minister. He has held numerous cabinet posts throughout his political life and was, in fact, throughout most of the 1980s and until uh, just last year, Israel's defense minister. He remains, according to all the public opinion polls, the most popular political figure in Israel. Mr. Rabin, we're honored by your presence here this evening. The Dean of the School, the Consul General of Israel, members of the faculty, <coughs> students, and ladies and gentlemen. The subject that uh, I was asked uh, to talk about are the prospects to the 90s from the Middle East, Israel's point of view. Allow me to say first, I am an Israeli. I can speak only as an Israeli. I don't pretend to be objective. I don't believe that there is anything that can be called objectivity when it comes to international relations. Because wherever there is a conflict, the best way to solve it is not to pretend to be objective, but to bring the parties to the conflict, to be the parties for negotiations and the parties to the solution of the conflict. Allow me to say that no doubt the Middle East today is under the impact of the crisis in the Gulf, the results of this crisis, at least in military terms and political terms. Therefore, allow me, in the way that I will bring to you the prospects for Israel, to introduce into them the lessons, the, comp the consequences of the crisis. As an Israeli, I look to the future with great confidence that basic conditions have changed in favor of Israel, in favor of more stability 
better security in the region, and even a hope to move ahead with the peace process between the Arab countries and the Palestinians in the territories and Israel. You may ask, what is the basis? What are the reasons on which you base your positive approach? No doubt, there are great opportunities, but dangers are involved. First, I believe that the change that has taken place on the international scene, the change in the interrelationship between, between those who used to be the superpowers, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the freedom of the Eastern European countries, the bankruptcy of communism, Russian style, the deterioration within the Soviet Union, even up to the verge of the fear of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. As an Israeli, I am fearful that there will be a total in disintegr uh, disintegration there. I don't know how many missiles with nuclear weapons are deployed in some of the Islamic Republic, republics. And if there will be disintegration, who will be in control of them? But no doubt, this brought about the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War. No doubt that as long as it was in existing, created the competition between the two superpowers for spheres of influence in the region, that accelerated the arms race. The Soviet could have, could, uh, could um, offer to the Arab countries, vis-a-vis -vis the American economic, hope for peace, only arms by which to wage war. And I believe this change will produce its results, not tomorrow, even in relations to the Arab-Israeli conflict. The second development for Israel, for the Jewish people, was the opening of the gates of the Soviet Union to the exodus of the members of the Jewish community there to Israel. In 1990, 200,000 arrived. In comparison, it's more than arrived from the Soviet Union between 1970 to 1985. For us, it's the fulfillment and the raison d'etre of the existence of Israel. For us, it's a tremendous quantitative and qualitative contribution. Sometimes I'm afraid to think what are the problems that we'll have to face. For example, as you know, Israel per capita have more doctors of medicine than any country of the world. After all, every Jewish mother would like her son <laughs> to be a doctor. Now, we have additional 5,000, by God. 3,000 doctors of medicine for every 100,000 who come to Israel. I don't know where we'll find jobs to them. But no doubt, in the long run, this immigration will bring with it in terms of professionalism, education, I hope motivation, a new push to Israel economy, if we'll find the framework in which it can be done. And the third reason, the crisis in the Gulf. Allow me to elaborate 
about the crisis in the Gulf. Now we after, I will not deal of what happened there. I will believe, uh, I'll deal with the Middle East and the Gulf after. What has changed? What are the dangers that have remained? And three, what are the ways by which to cope with the positive results and to neutralize the dangers? And at last, as an Israeli, to cope and to tackle the way that I believe the peace process between the Arab countries, Palestinians and Israel can be continued or resumed. What has changed as a result of the crisis in the Gulf is first and foremost the fact that brutal, naked, cruel aggression out of the blue of one Arab country, Iraq, against another Arab country, Kuwait, for the purpose which was far-reaching one, came to an end by the, the determination of the United States and the international community, politically and militarily, not only to stop, but to defeat the aggressor, its military machine, to liberate Kuwait, and to serve as a signal, no more megalomaniacs can dictate regional conflicts or global ones. As you know, today in Israel, we uh, mourn, we remember the Holocaust. It's the Memorial Day, Yom HaShoah. And I believe that if there were leaders, there were, there were people, there was a determination in Munich 38 to stop aggressor, as it was now in the crisis in the Gulf on smaller scale that could develop to a bigger one. There was no Munich in 1990-91. The aggressor was stopped, was defeated. It was created on a, a different background which I described before, uh, end of this Cold War, for all practical purposes, one superpower. And the, what was at stake was not only in the Middle East. It was not only a regional conflict. Even though a regional conflict that its implications were far beyond the Middle East, if Saddam Hussein would have allowed to absorb, annex, Kuwait, the next step would be Saudi Arabia and all the other Arab oil producing countries in the Arabian Peninsula. And one person, megalomaniac, would have his hand on the tap of the flow of oil for 40% of the energy demands of the free world. What was at stake under the new circumstances? Will the international scene will become a jungle or will it be built on new rules, new norms of behavior? And I cannot but express the great admiration and appreciation 
to the United States, the President, the Congress, the people, and the military forces of the United States, the men and women in uniform that performed so magnificent, magnificently and brilliantly in this war. The signal went to the region and all over the world. There is standard of behavior in accordance to international law and certain norms. Not a country that has succeeded to accumulate 6,500 tanks, 700 fighters, pay no attention to Europe, because what is Europe? vis-a-vis -vis the force of Iraq. The tank force of Iraq was four times bigger than the tank force of France, three times bigger than the tank force of Britain, bigger than the tank force of the Federal Republic of Germany. Europe for him was nothing. The major mistake that he made was about the United States. I believe that the first change was a dramatic change. Aggression was stopped. Megalomania was defeated. Munich 38 was not repeated in the Middle East and I believe over the international scene. Second, of course, it proved that the United States succeeded to create international coalition, a unique one, that showed the weakness of the Soviet Union, the weakness of Europe, but the readiness of eight Arab countries, Syria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates and the Sheikhdoms, to cooperate in fighting another Arab country with American and European forces, a precedent that has not taken place in the modern history of the Middle East, that Arab countries with American and European soldiers will fight another Arab country. What has changed in addition is the realization of some of the Arab countries that as long as there are unsolved conflicts, they might be used by radical megalomaniacs, not against Israel and not against the Christians in Lebanon, but against other Arab countries. Saddam Hussein did not challenge militarily Israel. He knew exactly that if you challenge Israel in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, we would not carry a, a surgical attacks. If he would have attacked our population in a context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, Baghdad, would not felt as they fe feel felt when the American attacked. We have made it clear any attack on our population will bring about 10 times, if not 100 times more attack on them. Therefore, he didn't dare to go only against Israel. He preferred to rob a bank on international scale by invading Kuwait. Therefore, there are more countries in the region that have got more opening to tackle the problems, to solve conflicts. What has changed even more? The building of new relationship between the eight Arab countries that I mentioned that collaborated in the, in the international coalition. Readiness to find ways 
how to work together. What has not changed? Saddam Hussein is still in power. Strangely enough, the revolts by the Shiites and by the Kurds brought the two centers of power in Iraq, the top military echelon and the Ba'ath Party, that their political future and therefore physical existence were endangered by the Shiite and the Kurd revolt. And we have seen that these two centers of power joined with Saddam Hussein and strengthened him because of fighting sectorial religious or groups within Iraq. Allow me to say quite frankly, when I learned that the Shiite revolt is backed by Iran, I didn't know what to think, what to wish to make to ourselves, to see instead of Saddam Hussein an Iraqi Shiite Ayatollah, which is dictated whenever or whatever he wants to do by Iran, it was not my dream of the development of the crisis in the Gulf. The Kurds is an entirely different story. Here again, Saddam Hussein shows his brutality, his use of indiscriminate firepower. If one promille of this would, would have been done by Israel in the territories, the whole world will be in, at our throat. But here the world is silent for Saddam Hussein within the Arab world, when Arab hits an Arab, it's legitimate, legitimate. And an Arab leader can bring about massacre of civilians, Kurds, citizens of his, of his own country by thousands, bringing the plight of hundreds of thousands, if not more, in accordance to Iranian sources, half a million, if not more, Kurds fled to Iran. I believe almost the same number to Turkey. And no one says anything. Or says, or drops some shoots with uh, tents, food, etc. Saddam Hussein remained in power to a large extent because of the Shiite revolt, to a lesser extent because of the Kurds. I hope that the resolution of the United Nations Security Council that ends uh, or brings about formal ceasefire today <coughs> will be tough enough in terms of the embargo of arms in terms of the, the demands of the destruction of the mass destruction weapons, and we'll see the end of his regime. Otherwise, otherwise, I'll be worried, not for Israel, to the regimes in the Arabian Peninsula, and for the achievement of the United States in all the fighting that was done against Iraq for the liberation of Kuwait. What has not changed? Iran policy. What has not changed is <coughs> the Arab-Israeli conflict. Therefore, I feel that to bring more stability, security to the Gulf, to the region, three things have to be done. First, not by military activities, by the continuation of all the sanctions, the embargoes, to try to bring about a change 
in the government of Iraq. Not by use of force. I'll never advise anyone in the United States to use force to be involved with civilians, Iraqi civilians. I believe it was a brilliant idea by the United States when they entered Iraq and cut the main highway between Basra and Iraq and Baghdad, not to enter any town or city, not to be involved in occupation of Iraqi centers of population. I believe it was a brilliant approach that practically came out of the lessons that were learned in Vietnam and in Beirut. First, to try by activities of the United Nations Security Council and their implementation to create situation that the Iraqi people, not certain sector, not certain minority, will bring him down. Second, to create security arrangements within the eight Arab countries that joined with the international community. The rich, and the, the rich financially and the weak militarily, with the strong militarily and the poor economically. Between the six, Saudi Arabia, and the Kuwait and the other oil pinsdoms, Egypt first and Syria on the basis of the equation that anyhow has developed security or military assistance in the format of inter-Arab force of only the Arab countries that were part of the international coalition to strengthen the security of the Arab oil producing countries in the Arabian Peninsula for massive financial aid, economic aid, to Egypt, hopefully to Jordan, hopefully to the Palestinians in the territories, instead to give it to Arafat and his gang that have never delivered assistance to 1.6, 1.7 million Palestinians in the territories. They took all the money for their villas, for the five-star hotels, missions, all over the world, the Palestinians in the territories, if they got $5 million from the $100 million that Saudi Arabia gave to the PLO, and thanks God, Saudi decided to cut it, I hope that Saudi Arabia will give the $100 million to the Palestinians in the territories. They deserve it, not Mr. Arafat and his gang in Tunisia, Baghdad, or elsewhere. Now we see this cooperation develops because the danger to the stability of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan is for the Islam, fundamentalistic Islamic groups that they can grow only on the ground of economic, social problems, frustration. And once there will be the kind of financial aid. And here, Saddam Hussein succeeded in his propaganda about the real and a total lack of equality in the minimum sense, in the distribution of the Arab wealth. He became, among the Arab masses, the modern Arab Robin Hood. And I'm glad that the United States made it clear to the Arab countries, forget about Marshall Plan. The money is here. Saudi Arabia alone, between August 2nd, the end of 90, the end, end of uh, the year of 90, increased its revenue from oil in five months by 20 to 30 billion dollars. Kuwait maintains holding company of assets and liquidities all over the world in the worth of 80 to 100 billion dollars. 
why the United States or Europe should give assistance if the Arab countries cannot help their brothers in the other Arab countries. And this equation, military assistance for economic assistance between Egypt, Syria, and the rich Arab countries, I believe it's a formula, good one, for security arrangements in the Gulf that will reduce the burden on the United States to maintain their, its own forces. Try to imagine if there will be no security arrangements and one of these regimes will be undermined. How many American people will come to the president, to the Congress, and will ask, what for we fought, what for we, we fought there? If uh, everything is in total collapse? And the third issue is to start to renew tackling the Arab-Israeli conflict. Allow me to say, I found today in the administration, in the Congress, in certain circles in the United States, better understanding to Israel's security problem. Allow me to say, How much forces, how, how much time the superpower, the United States, needed to overcome Iraq? Took five and a half months. Half a million soldiers, out of them 400,000 Americans, were concentrated in the area. 1,000 to 1,200 fighter bombers of the United States Air Force, Navy, and its allies, three to 4,000 tanks. All this was done with the consent of the international community, led by the United States, agreed by the Soviet Union, against one Arab country. Now try to imagine what Israel is in the need if we might be attacked by a coalition of more than one Arab country. And when you try to say it to an American, he starts to understand what is the problem, the security problem of Israel. And we live in a region in which international agreement is not the Holy Bible, is not the Holy Quran, it's practically nothing, as Saddam Hussein proved it, vis-a-vis -vis Iran and vis-a-vis -vis Kuwait. But, no doubt, Israel is ready to renew the efforts to bring about the beginning of a meaningful peace process. Therefore, when Secretary Baker came the first time, especially the second, and offered a regional conference under the auspices of the United States and the Soviet Union, if the Soviet Union will normalize relations with Israel, to which the Arab countries, a Palestinian delegation will be invited with the purpose, after certain statements, reaching beforehand certain law common denominator on which we can operate, to follow two tracks. One track, Israel and the Palestinians in the territories. Another one, Israel with every Arab country which is ready to negotiate peace on a bilateral basis based on Resolution 242 and 338 of the Security Council. I believe that it is possible, it was proved by Egypt, that peace is not a, a dream, abstract dream. It is attainable. And when there was an Arab leader that was ready to do it, it was achieved. But allow me to refer to the Palestinian problem. I have clear conscience vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. 
and allow me to say why. All through the way, the Jewish community in Palestine, Israel, were ready to compromise. 1938, Lord Peel Commission proposed partition of former British Mandate Palestine to two states. I don't want even to, remember, to remind myself, myself what was the proposal for the Jewish state. We agreed. Palestinians, the Arab world rejected. 1947, United Nations decision about the partition of former British Mandate Palestine to two states. The Jewish community accepted. The Palestinian rejected, the Arab world rejected. Not only rejected, they went to war with the purpose to destroy the resolution and to push us to the sea. General Marshall, then Secretary of State of the United States, didn't give us a chance to survive more than three months. Field Marshal Montgomery was in doubt if the Jewish community would be able to withstand the waves of the Arabs for two months. As it happened since then, bad luck to the Arabs. Whenever they go to war against us, they lose. They have not learned yet the lesson from that. The end of the, the war, our war of independence. Between 48 to 1967, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, were in Arab hands. If the Palestinian problems is the crux, the heart, of the Arab-Israeli conflict, why? No demand, no attempt to create a Palestinian state. Israel intervened, Israel prevented it. We could do it, by no means no. The Arabs still believed that it would be possible to finish and annihilate Israel. This is why when it was possible, and it was up to the Arabs and the Palestinians to bring about the creation of a Palestinian state then, they didn't want it. They didn't demand it. It was not the heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict. After the Six-Day War, the situation was changed in one direction, which I spoke about, is vis-a-vis -vis Egypt, they decided to embark on the course of negotiations, and we have peace between Egypt and Israel. Regardless to what has happened, I believe, as an Israeli, that there is a need to solve the Palestinian problem, not because it's the heart, the crux of the Arab-Israeli conflict, not because today, it's in the interest of Israel to deal also with the Arab countries because the threat to our very existence is from the military threat that can be presented by the armed forces of Arab countries led by Saddam Hussein or even Hafez al-Assad. The Palestinian terror from Lebanon, the Intifada, is not a threat to our very existence. The terror is the weapon of the weak. Therefore, we came in May 89 within the National Unity Government and we changed vis-a-vis -vis to the Camp David Accords. In accordance to the Camp David Accords, Israel had to negotiate autonomy to the Palestinians between Israel and Egypt. We said no. We recognize the Palestinians that reside in the territories the 1.7 million, that their fate and future will be decided in this process, to become a legitimate partner with which Israel has to negotiate equally like with Jordan. And we offered a three-phased movement toward a permanent solution. Phase number one, free democratic elections 
enrich the Palestinians in the territories, will elect from themselves, by themselves, a representation. Whoever will be elected, pro-PLO, pro-Hamas, it's okay. As long as the elections are done in a context to move ahead to self-rule, self-government, call it whatever you want, that will allow the Palestinians in the territories to run their affairs with the exception of defense and foreign policy. Something that not Jordan, not Egypt offered them that when they were in occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And we don't say it's for permanent solution. It's interim agreement for transitional period, not longer than five years and not later than three years after its establishment, we, the Palestinian representation in Jordan, will negotiate permanent solution on the basis of resolution 242 and 338. They can come with whatever they want then, but not to make it precondition pre to move on the first two phases because of what they think should be the, the permanent solution. I believe that it's a good proposal. Nothing of this kind was offered to the Palestinians by the Arab world in a real meaningful way. In my talks with many Palestinians in the territories, I told them, your tragedy is the fact that you have chosen the leaders since Haj Amin al husseini the Mufti of Jerusalem, Ahmad Shukir, Yasser Arafat, that brought one disaster after another on your heads. Look at us. 1917, the British Empire offered us Balfour Declaration. We took it. 38, partition plan. We said, OK. 47, partition plan. We said, OK. From 49 to 67, every prime minister of Israel offered peace on the lines that existed. When the Sixth Day War broke out, the Vyashkol, Prime Minister, then sent a message to Jordan, to the United States government, and made it clear if Jordan stopped shelling Jerusalem, our settlement, and will keep out of the war, Israel will keep its commitment not to do anything. And if Jordan would have followed Prime Minister then of Israel request, the West Bank is Jerusalem, were not been in our hands. But Jordan decided differently. I believe there is a good chance. If there will be a realization on the part of the Arab countries, Israel will not agree to international fully-fledged peace conference. We don't need the Europeans. And I don't know what the, what the People's Republic of China has to do in, with the Arab-Israeli conflict. I don't, I have not heard that they have solved their own problem in the aftermath of the Beijing affair. Therefore, if the Arab countries United States, others will follow. First, continuation of what the resolutions of the Security Council vis-a-vis -vis Iraq be pursued, be adopted, hopefully, to bring a change in Iraq. Second, new interrelationship within the eight Arab countries, might be that Jordan will join to it, of symbiotic relationship that have never existed, of offering security to the Gulf countries and the Gulf countries, offering economic aid to the Arab masses that their main problem is ec economic development, education, health services, 
and to the Palestinians in the territories. I would like to see $200 million given by the rich Arab countries, but directly, or through UNDP, United Nations agencies, to the Palestinians in the territories, rather to serve Meglo another mini megalomaniac like Arafat. And thirdly, to continue with the peace process on the basis of the proposal of Secretary Baker, I believe even the beginning, the feelings that there is even a small step by itself create new realities, new attitudes. Considerable part of the Arab-Israeli conflict is psychological, emotional, backload of suspicion, hatred, and prejudices. And I remember President Sadat said once, why he decided to go to Jerusalem? Because he saw these walls, the psychological walls, more of the problem than the practical issues. And he brought down the walls of suspicion, hatred, and prejudices. He was a unique historic phenomena with great courage and imagination. I don't believe that there will be another Arab leader that will follow his uh, footsteps. But I see today a crack in this wall, this wall of psychological feelings that prevent the movements to peace. I believe that if Secretary Baker, the United States, will continue his efforts and others will support him and will see the first step it will be a sign of great help to all the peoples, all the countries of the region and to the world. This is the way that I see it. And let's hope that this is what will happen. The involvement of the United States, the tremendous dominant prestige that the United States gained gives to it the opportunity, but also puts on it the responsibility to bring about this meeting, this beginning, once it will start, something will work well, something will work not as well, but there will be a beginning, a movement. I believe it is possible. This is the way that I see the prospects, not for the, all the 90s, but for the beginning of the 90s. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is our custom at the uh, forum to uh, have uh, questions from the audience. There are two microphones here on the uh, ground floor. If you'll come up to the microphone and uh, state your question, please, briefly and succinctly, not, uh, not uh, statements of, of your own views, but your question for the, uh, the Prime Minister. Yes, over here, please. Certainly. What effect on the Middle East would recognition of Israel by some of the Arab states um, primarily Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, have on the Middle East conflict? And what chances do you think there are that this will happen in the near future? Can you ref uh, define exactly the first, qu the first part of your question? What effect do you think that recognition of Israel by Arab states, such as Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, would have on the Middle East conflict? And what chances do you think there is that this will happen? 
allow me first to say, I don't believe that Israel has ever asked for recognition. What does it mean to recognize? To come and to say that you exist. I wondered all the time about this question of recognition, how the Arab countries fought for 43 years something that didn't exist. <laughs> uh, therefore, <coughs> the question, the way that I saw it, the essence that we need as a basis for peace with us is reconciliation, not recognition. Reconciliation with the existence of Israel as a Jewish independent democratic state in which non-Jews entertain full civilian and political rights. Whoever is, is an Israeli citizen is equal to the others. This was, this is the issue. For the Arab countries, leaders, our Arab people, it's difficult to cross the Rubicon from non-reconciliation into reconciliation. This is the issue. I wish that every Arab country will, rec if not will re reconcile with Israel, will end the state of war, will ignore the Arab boycott, not only on Israel, on third countries. We have not reached this point. And I doubt if tomorrow Saudi Arabia will be the first to do it the way that I see it. Before we we'll start with the Palestinians and the neighboring Arab countries, I don't expect very much from the Arab countries that have no common border or neighbors as well. But I wish it will happen. If I can ask a follow-up. Um, Short. Let other people have a chance to okay. ask questions. Yes. Mr. Rabin, you uh, talked very positively about the role of the United States and the potential role of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the peace process. And my question to you is, what hope do you think there is and what kind of influence could we as American citizens be bringing to bear on our government so that they could in turn uh, help influence the Arab countries to end the Arab boycott, or at least the secondary Arab boycott, particularly given the rebuilding of Kuwait? I don't believe that uh, it will be fair in the open to ask me to advise you what to do as American citizen vis-a-vis uh, -vis your government. We have enough opportunity to express our own views to the U.S. government all its agencies. We believe that uh, if somebody <coughs> speaks about confidence building measures, one of the, and they refer only to Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. I said time and again when I was Minister of Defense, I'm ready to release everybody from jail, the tensions, areas, etc. if there will be no violence. I'm not in love with uh, uh, carrying out uh, orders to detain administratively people or to bring to court uh, for jail. If there will be no violence, I'll be more than happy. I said it to the Palestinians, to get rid of all the limitations. They were made only against violence. I don't believe that it's possible now uh, to achieve, let's say, end of state of war. To what extent it will be possible to ask from the Arab countries also something in the context of confidence building measures, I believe that the best advice will be not even pub publicly, but practically, to ignore at least the Arab boycott on third countries. There was another idea which I didn't like. 
to bring about a new resolution in the General Assembly that uh, cancels the 75 resolution that uh, relates uh, Zionism to racism. I don't mind that the UN will remain to be seen as irrelevant, unjust, and this resolution will continue to be part of his tremendous achievements. <laughs> Therefore, I hope that in the context of... Co you and Mr. Perez share a political party that at the time was part of a coalition and now is out of government. And I guess my question is, um, what well, we've seen... For how know, long we'll express uh, hope, huh? No. As long as we'll be let's, alive. Let's, let's, get, let's, get to an e let's get to an easier question. What prospects do you see for internally in Israel the type of electoral reform that will allow policies to be carried out without being held hostage by small groups um, with their interests that might be very different from the mainstream? Allow me to say, I have to be frank with you. I can't blame the Likud alone. We were party to the creation, not less than the Likud, of the situation in which the king makers in Israel are the Haredic and the religious parties. In accordance to our system today, and to the extent that one can predict the future, the religious parties are the kingmakers. Why? The Likud and the right parties to it cannot form alone a coalition government. Labor to the left, including the Arab parties, cannot form a coalition. This is why I supported the creation of the national unity government. We did not exploit this period to bring about a change. And both parties, I can't say that my conscience is clear and clean because of my own party. Therefore, I was glad and I support the idea that legislation that brought by four members of the Knesset one of the Likud, Uri Elin, Labour Party, David Libai, from Raful Party, Tzidon, Rubinstein, that passed the, the uh, legislation that, uh, after the first call, that calls for change of government by direct election of the Prime Minister by the whole population. Not a presidential system, a different system, that still within the parliamentarian framework, that the majority, for example, of 70 members out of 120 can bring down the prime minister, but with him, new elections of themselves too. And I know them. They will not be <laughs> eager to vote out the prime minister while they're voting themselves out for re-election. I believe without changing the government system and direct election of the prime minister, there will be no clear-cut decision in Israel between the two basic schools of thought, Likud and Labour. In democracy, the voter can be wrong. The voter always decides. But to put it in a clear-cut way, And to have a government of, in Israel that can, can govern. The system collapsed, especially in the last year, especially after the split of the national unity government. Therefore, I believe this is one of the major issues. It's easy to me in the, or the Labour Party in the opposition to say so. Because when we tried to, to catch the religious parties to support us, we were committed to them the same things that uh, basically the Likud, almost everything that the Likud uh, promised them. The system collapsed. 
and unless there will be a change, not in the electoral system, in the change of government system and direct election, if this will be achieved, there will be a real change in Israel. Will it be I can't promise you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm really, I'm sorry that we did not exploit the period that we were in the national unity government to achieve it. It could be done. It could be done then. Illusions on both sides undermined it. Mr. Rabin, with the end of the Cold War and the Soviet Union's decreased funding of Arab regimes in the Middle East, some argue that the urgent need for U.S.-Israel cooperation has diminished. Yet during the recent Gulf War, we saw that U.S.-Israel cooperation had never been higher with Israel agreeing not to retaliate for Iraqi missile attacks. How do you assess the current U.S.-Israel relationship and how do you think the average Israeli views the U.S. in the current peace process? Well, first and foremost, allow me to explain to you that from the very beginning, and I know it, I became Minister of Defense in October 84. From the very beginning, the United States, and we understood it as a superpower, its interests were far beyond Israel alone. Therefore, there were two lines of strategic cooperation that carried out by the United States with the countries of the region. One line with Israel. It was done through UCOM, the European Command. It was done in, for certain purposes. And a second line to Sankom with the Arab countries. And we were told, I heard it seven years ago, that if there would be a crisis within the Arab world in which the United States will have to take part, Israel should be out. And I, I understood the logic of it. Therefore, I'll tell you a story. In February 90, General Schwarzkopf, who was in command then of Senko, visited the region. I, as a Minister of Defense, asked an American official, will uh, General Schwarzkopf will come to visit of, uh, in Israel? They said, by no means no. He is for the Arab side. He is the line of, Esen not he personally, Senko is a line of cooperation with the Arab countries. Yukom is with Israel. Therefore, is nothing new about it. And I understood it very well. I knew that uh, the United States has got interest in the Arab countries. I was interested that the United States will have more influence in many Arab countries because I believe that the United States, in contradiction to what the Soviet Union policy was, is to encourage stability to solving conflict by peaceful means. <clears throat> Therefore, I believe the situation has improved as a result of the understanding to Israel difficulties during the Scud period, the fighting, and the way that Israel behaved. Hopefully, now when Israel responded positively, to Secretary Baker and his idea, it will be even in a better situation. Mr. Rabin, uh, the Arab countries refused to meet with Israel except in the context of an international conference, and then only if all the Arab countries remain in the room with Israel at the same time. Now, the various Arab countries bordering Israel have very different issues with regard to Israel, so it seems that Israel's suggestion of, in, of individual direct negotiations makes sense. Why won't they follow this? What are they scared of? Who? The Arab countries who won't meet with Israel one-on-one. -on -one. First, in the past, we had negotiations, direct and indirect, 
with the Arab countries on the basis of one-to-one. -one. We did it at the end of War of Independence when we signed the armistice agreement. It was on one-to-one, face-to-face. Second, it took place uh, during, after the Yom Kippur War, in the disengagement. Then it was not face-to-face, -face, but we had disengagement agreements signed between Israel and Egypt, and later on signed between Israel and Syria. Three, we had it with Egypt, face-to-face, -face, that brought about the peace treaty between our two countries. Why they are afraid? I, do. I believe this is the, the walls on which I spoke before. And the fear that their fate would be the fate of President Sadat, would be the fate of many Palestinians who would like to see, I refer Palestinians in the territories, that know what is the meaning to be responsible to the economy, the education, the health, the municipal problems of 1.6 million Palestinians that Mr. Arafat and his gang has never, have never been responsible to that. Why they can't emerge? Because let's say in 1990, more Palestinians were killed by Palestinians than in clashes with the Israeli security forces. Why? The PLO extreme groups know that without spreading terror, without threatening anyone in the territories that doesn't comply with them, they lose their grip on them. They lose influence. It's controlled by terror and brutality. Why the Arab countries don't want? I believe that some would be ready. But again, the problem is their survival as a regime, as a human being. Unless there will be, in certain contexts, because there are no more Sadats or Mubaraks in the region, unfortunately. We, we have a saying in the Middle East, for war, one side is enough. For peace, you need it to. Peace and imposition are in contradiction. Peace cannot be imposed. Peace has to be derived from the decision of today's the parties to the conflict to put an end to it and to establish relations of peace. We are in a search of them. We succeeded to find one. We are the other, after the others. We have time for one more question here. Mr. Rubin, I'd like to turn back to um, is, uh, internal affairs and ask what your impression is on the influx of the Soviet Union. On? on the electoral system. They say that the influx of Soviet Jews on the electoral system, they say that the primary effect will be secularization, um, that the Soviet Jews who are coming in aren't as interested in, in the religious parties and that it should become more of a Likud labor type of, um, type of system. The problem with also is that they are supposedly not going to labor but to Likud. And I was hoping you could speak on that and also possibly say a few sentences about uh, their integration into Israel. Well, first, our main purpose is to bring them in to find which is a gigantic or oh, tremendous great job to absorb them, to offer them housing, to create jobs for them. It's an unbelievable job. You know, if I take it proportionally, we absorbed in 1990 200,000 to a population of little bit more of 4 million people. If I translate it to American terms, the ratio of our population vis-a-vis -vis the American population is 50, 1 to 50. It is to say that the United States 
would have to absorb in one year 10 million immigrants. Proportion to one citizen of the United States and Israel. This is the scale of absorbing 200,000 in one year by a little bit more than 4 million people, including Israeli and Arab citizens. To the United States, 10 million. Now, as I said, they are immigrants in the real sense. They are not tempted to go to the territories so far, they would like to prefer to focus on the two basic problems. They were uprooted from their country, society, jobs, habits, language, culture, planted in Israel. They mainly deal with housing, jobs. I met with groups. They didn't ask me questions about the territories, or they asked me about daily life problem. And it's only understandable. Most of them are not religious. And they look to me more moderate. How they'll vote, I don't know. And I don't know if anyone will know till the elections. In Israel, there is a democracy and there is a secret ballot. And no one knows how people will vote. But basically, I believe that they might represent more moderation and will not contribute to the increase of the voters to the ultra-Orthodox parties. Thank you very much.